contrarian, leave it to contrarian badass. badass, Reggie Middleton. She called the housing crash, she called the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, and the crisis in the Eurozone banking system. So let's jump to analyzing potential investments. Okay, so there's gatekeepers, there's evolution of currency, it's barely scratching the surface of 200 million, there's risks to weigh. How does an investor, maybe somebody who has limited knowledge of the actual technology, but is a tried and true investor and wants to get involved, how do they analyze the investment opportunities that are out there in the market? <coughs> Reggie? You do it the same way you invest in any other opportunity and investments in investment. So what you're investing in should not alter your methodology of uh, gauging what you should invest. Uh, just quickly, we have a couple of hedge funders. Anybody in the hedge fund industry? Asset manager? What's the price of reward? What's the price I want for Bitcoin? The price of reward. Of reward? Yes. So Trick price, question. I, 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 Are you asking risk versus reward? Yes. My risk. Risk reward analysis? Right, just doing layman's term. Just risk. What's the price of reward? I think risk is the answer. Oh, it's volatility. Okay, well, volatility. I actually, I'm a stickler for this because I see the media misrepresents a lot of things, and especially um, uh, DLT or blockchain related, and these misrepresentations now become fat simply because they've been repeated over and over. So just to use these uh, this term, um, I agree that the price of reward is risk. So anytime you seek a reward, in order to gauge whether it's a good investment, you have to measure the risk, units of risk you pay to receive that reward. So if I pay $1 of risk, right, you get $5 of reward, and then theoretically, I'm up four units, very good investment. If I pay $2 of risk, you get $1 of reward, and then I overpay. Now, the way math works, you may see a nominal gain by paying $2 of risk, $1 of reward, but over time, you should lose money, okay? Now, you spoke on volatility. Um, most of the units that are invested or what, um, the risk is calculated as volatility. And if you look at a lot of the um, pop media, they say don't invest in Bitcoin because it's volatile. And my response is big deal, it's volatile. It doesn't matter how volatile it is if you don't measure the reward that you get for the volatility, number one. Number two, volatility is not bad, even if you're an investor, not a trader. So I can purchase this iPhone. This iPhone goes up 10% in price, then 30% in price, 8,000% in price, then 40,000% in price. It is volatile as a long only investor. Do I have a problem with that? <coughs> well, I don't personally. I don't know if anybody else does, but I appreciate the volatility shooting through the roof. So as a long only investor, what you're really concerned with is downside uh, volatility. So it doesn't matter how volatile, it doesn't matter what the standard deviation is, you're concerned about how far it goes against your investment thesis versus how far up. So to simplify that, you measure the potential investment um, opportunities in cryptocurrencies by risk adjusted return. You take the downside, and downside should be defined as it going against you. You take the downside risk, subtracted from your reward or upside return. You have that number and then you can compare that number to oil, the bonds, the treasuries, the real estate, to going out on a date with your ex-girlfriend. Anything. Okay? Risk is just a return. <laughs> Do you want to add to it? Yeah, definitely. So completely agree. I see the industry as a whole as an option without time decay. So it's not like it's going to zero because of some sort of uh, or what is it, theta or what, what not. Uh, in my eyes, Bitcoin in 20 years is either gonna be at zero or a million, and probability-wise, I see a positive expected return in my eyes. If you're looking at individual projects, I would compare it to sort of a blend of analyses between global macro and venture capital, which would normally have nothing at all in common, but in this case, you sort of have the worst of birth, both worlds. You're supposed to sort of try to understand what are the broad industry fund flows, how are funds flowing between different projects when they're trading, 
And then you sort of do the traditional analysis of team, project, uh, market size that they're trying to address. And you also look at things based around the type of token that you're trying to analyze. If it's an equity token, it's pretty straightforward. You do this kind of cash flow model, uh, you figure out what the asset the company are, uh, relative value val uh, valuation, whatnot. Uh, if you're talking about tokens that represent excess capacity, if this is a limiting factor, you start thinking about the intensity of the token use within the ecosystem. And you think about that the same way if you start looking at the token as a piece of the individual uh, business process as well. So uh, sort of a, a coupling of a lot of different disciplines, but ultimately uh, you have to bring it back to risk and reward and you're sort of doing the research to de-risk projects in your mind. So figuring out how competent is the team, have they done this stuff before, what is their uh, impact on the market, how well can they market their product to affect those in funding flows and things like that. So very, very dynamic way of sort of looking at this, ultimately leading back to Reggie's risk versus reward. And, and just one addendum, if you take the two largest uh, cryptocurrencies, which would be Bitcoin and Ethereum, you run a downside only risk adjusted reward analysis and compared to anything else, it blows every major and almost every minor asset class out of the water, 20,000% or so, Oops. easily. And it's, it's not complicated math, you could download it, so you know, ratio, you could adjust for downside risk. Uh, you just take a look at the numbers. Bitcoin started 2009, 2010, I think it was about maybe two to 10 um, tokens per penny, something like that, and Bitcoin, took a pretty big, nasty dive, but it's still trading about $6,300. Go from, what, 20 units per penny to 6,300, and then compare it to any stock, any asset class, oil, commodities, fixed income, you name it. You can multiply those uh, legacy asset classes by 10, when you come close. But if you read the media, they still say it's risky because it's volatile. You have an equation, the equation means you have to analyze both sides, not just one. Those are two, uh those are two extremely well thought out answers. Uh, I like a lot of what both of these guys just said. Um, the old, wow, I wanna, geez, I was taking notes and there's so many points on that. But, you, know, you, you said in your last statement it's a $200 million market right now. Sorry, $200 billion? Billion? Yeah. Billion. Uh, not even scratching the surface at $200 billion. Yeah. That's why the risk is just gonna be so minuscule, right, in, in, in Reggie's statement. Um, I do, however, also want to bring it back to the point that uh, Kirill made was it's either going to be zero or a million. And yeah, uh, it's an option. I actually do believe that. I'm going to disagree with Reggie and think that it's probably going the zero route unless it's tied to another thing that Kirill also mentioned was the success of a company. So take something like. Bitcoin, it's not tied to anything. Now you have all these other cryptocurrencies coming out. Um, this is the reason. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing when we issue our ICO in uh, March, our ICO will have a weighted confidence level based on artificial intelligence as well as machine learning and, and using blockchain that actually uses the general feel of is this company successful or not? So buying into our currency will actually have a measurable uh, indicator as to whether or not it's increasing or decreasing. And I personally feel that's where the industry is going, which is going to drive the, um, the zero or million factor um, you know, one way or the other based on whether or not the currency is tied to it. I was just like, you know, you guys just hit some really interesting topics there. Yeah, so it's it's interesting because you don't necessarily have to think about it as an actual company because a lot of these are just open source projects or and verticals. teams can build whichever direction they want. I, I mean, not to open up the rabbit hole, but there's been a lot of discussion about how Bitcoin should grow and that's sort of sprung into a few multiple projects. So it, it's sort of... Uh, important to not just gauge the company, but sort of the community that's involved in this. So is it mostly just people trying to pump a token, or is it people actively involved in a project? Uh, so it's, a, it's another dynamic that you don't really see in traditional asset classes, sort of the investor base itself. So
passion. I don't, I don't want to leave you out on this topic because it, 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 you, you want to weigh in? I could jump to the next question that actually has a name on it anyway, but would you like to weigh in on the... No, let's do the next question. Okay. It's on, uh, far, far more advanced in this stuff. So the next question is, what are some of the fundamental shifts in society that have, be that have boosted the popularity of a distributed cryptographic ledger system in a stateless dis digital currency of value. So I think this comes back to the point I made before, and, and uh, we we at Conestone uh, do believe in appropriate skepticism, um, and, and the two gentlemen just then uh, I think are, are, are putting together a, a powerful endeavour in this process. I do believe. We do believe, because we like to look at investments through the environmental, social, and governance factors. What are the social trends that catalyze things like this? And I think um, Reggie has referred to them in the past. There is concern about the quality of our institutions, right? About whether we trust our banks and our central banks to do what we think is right. But in other parts, we've lost a lot of trust, I feel, um, on, a, on an individual basis in the US. Uh, the number of people who say they trust most other people is now 20% which is the lowest it's ever been. And so the question for us about why a trustless system would emerge at this point is also important from a thematic place. And the question of trust is that um, there is a whole lot of entrepreneurial structure around creating what we see as systems which give people more access, that recognize more, that have potential sort of online democracy or however it's structured. I think blockchain has captured that zeitgeist in a very powerful way. There are other trends, I think, whether it be low yields on investing in other areas and questions about um, you know, the, this sort of security nature of, of our funds, whether it happened in you know, bank closures in different parts of the world. But the question to me still 